Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Tangerine Holt. I'm the Executive Director of the Australian American Fulbright Commission, based in Canberra. And we are on the roadshow right now, so delighted to be at RMIT University as our state university host. And to kick off, um, we've been on the road for the last three weeks. So and we've got another three weeks to go. And I've told my kids not to expect me home for dinner. Go get your own dinner. Um, and I think um, it's a great thing that our outreach model has changed. And we're here to do targeted presentations uh, because we're looking for the best and brightest. But before I go into this um, welcome to the postgraduate scholarships information session for the Fulbright Commission, I want to acknowledge uh, country. I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of this land and pay my respects to the elders past and present. The Fulbright Commission is here with Dr. Ruth Lee Martin, our Senior Manager of Scholarships, and with Mr. Matt Kemp, our Scholarships Officer. Uh, we have with us alumni, uh, Abel John Buechner from Monash University. We have Deborah Jane Lee, our State Secretary for Victoria, which will manage the postgraduate selection process as well here. So it's really delighted to have you. So I want to say welcome to all of you in person, those of you who are present, and those of you who are virtually online. Uh, thank you to all the universities for coming on board, uh, Deakin, Monash, uh, BU, RMIT and University of Melbourne students also present here. We're really looking forward to engaging with a solid discussion on things. Um, this, this day would have happened without a lot of work being put in by a number of staff members. And so it's just only fit and fair for me to acknowledge them. AJ, thank you for being so wonderful. Uh, you've been working with us and to Nairi. Matthew on the camera and Adam for getting us all hooked up today. So let's, um, let's um, talk about Fulbright and give you an overview. So my goal here today is to, I guess, talk about the Fulbright scholarships, present to you the opportunity, invite you to apply, but to put in a solid application that is competitive, that is exciting, that is innovative, that brings to the table that the selection committee wants to know who you are. They want to interview you. And so it's bringing that passion. We're looking for people who can actually bring the whole package. We're looking for people who are not only academically excellent, but also individuals who understand why the Fulbright's important in their lives. So the Fulbright for us, in terms of the mission, we are here to promote educational cultural exchange between Australia and the United States. And our vision in, through our scholarship program is to continue to be that leading prestigious scholarship body which gives you those opportunities and those valued collaborations more not only nationally not only with the u.s but regionally to make that impact and globally as well so a little history in terms of the fulbright commission we've been you know the fulbright uh, program has been established by the vision of one man senator jw william fulbright and the u.s government so it's established in 160 countries. So a fabulous network of richness and legacy and alumni and strong network. So there's over 300,000 Fulbright scholars in the world. There are about 50 binational commissions in the world. Australia is one of 50 binational commissions, which means a partner country co-funds the program. So for example, in Afghanistan, there is no uh, by a national commission, but the U.S. Embassy post um, uh, administers the program there. So for us, in terms of the Fulbright Commission, we've been in existence for about 65 years. Um, through that program, we've established and sent about almost 5,000 scholars between both our countries during the 65-year period. We are funded by the Australian and American governments and a core group of sponsors. And that's where we are able to offer a number of scholarships across a number of categories. So I, I can proudly stand and say I think we're the only prestigious scholarship body which not only offers postgraduates, but we offer distinguished chairs, senior scholars, professionals, postdocs. And that's why we're going to have targeted sessions um, throughout the day today, um, asking for and inviting applications across those categories. The Australian Prime Minister and the US Ambassador in Australia are my co honorary chairs. And I report to a 10-member binational board of mem um, members handpicked by both governments, uh, and they have their terms of appointment. So, in terms of the Fulbright program, for us, you know, 
to keep in mind that we are a scholarship body that provides a very generous monthly stipend for you to establish. We do not provide scholarship for tuition fees. So as a postgraduate, I guess today is asking you, where are you in your career path? Where do you see yourself in three to five years? How does the Fulbright fit into this picture? How can we come on your journey? How can you be part of our legacy? Um, and it's asking you a question, I guess. What do you want to be when you grow up? Have you thought about it? So you all youngsters, you know, you might be doing a master's program, you might be doing, finishing your undergraduate, but where does the Fulbright fit into your journey? That is very important in terms of starting the write-up of your application. So let me step back for a moment and say again, as a Fulbright Commission, we will fund eight to 10 months of your study as a postgraduate student. It's a great way, if you're a PhD student, to take that time off to go and answer a research question in the United States. Bring back new knowledge, translate that, change the way your thesis looks, you know. It's, it's giving you that opportunity. But if you want to go and do a full master's degree in the US, or a full PhD qualification in the United States, then you must be aware that it costs a lot of money and tuition fees is something we do not um, sponsor. So we provide you the stipend, but we provide you a nice travel allowance, an establishment allowance. The US government provides us with some emergency insurance, if you will, up to $100,000. And a total package of our scholarship for eight to 10 months is about $40,000. Apart from those are the benefits. I mean, you're going to be accessing a number of alumni and networks. I mean, Fulbright will change your life. It will open up new doors, new avenues for you. And it's going to give you a platform for excellence. And that's why I asked you the question, where do you see yourself in three to five years? And how does Fulbright fit into that journey? It's really important for you to understand we're giving you a platform. So for us, when we select you, we actually bring you together in an orientation program. We lock you down with the Americans for three days. We were in Perth this time around. We had about 46 of our scholars. Great brain circulation happening. I mean, that's the only place you get to mess with the minds of Americans through the Fulbright program. I always say that, as do the Americans and the Australians. And once they start talking, and we're in this lockdown mode, you know, it's kind of that continuing that journey. And, um, so the orientation program brings you together, but also we as a commission work with two partners. One is the Institute of International Education. And that's very important for you as postgraduates because they are the ones who is going to support you while in the US, give you all the admin support, help us with the visa process and all of those things. But they are there to also provide you enrichment opportunities. So IIE will host 160 countries the scholars and students from 160 countries, and they will organize enrichment programs in the US. So if you are in DC, you might end up in California for three days for a weekend to work with other scholars and students from Brazil, from you know, Guatemala, from Germany. It doesn't matter, there's a whole opportunities there, and that's why I say it's a very rich opportunity for you. In addition, as postgraduates, once you're selected, Throughout twice a year, we will run a mini competition for our um, US, uh, for our Australian um, postgraduate students in the US. We have a special travel grant. It's called the Fulbright um, Gregory Schwartz Grant, which gives you about another $1,250 to go to a conference. And so it's a mini competition we have each year, twice a year, in fact. And there we give about four grants to our postgraduate students. I guess the message to you is that. We are here about enriching your experience, and we want to give you every opportunity to excel. Um, so it's the benefits. Sometimes people look at the package in terms of cost. I'll say look at it as benefits as being priceless, because you cannot put a price on the experience you have through a full right. So I'll share with you as we go along some of the scholars who have got their um, full right this year. Rachel Heenan, she's our postgraduate student from the University of Melbourne. She's going to Harvard University School of Public Health, and um, she's going to be looking at her collaborative research on economic burdens posed by, you know, rheumatic heart disease. So 
It's really important in terms of people doing this kind of work which is affecting vulnerable populations and people who are living on the margins, including Indigenous Australians. And so these are innovative projects coming through who are making a difference. And I want to stress that importance because Fulbright is not only about you, it's about the bigger picture. We're looking for people who want to make a difference and bring about change. And I guess the message to you today is, even if you're a postgraduate student, um, do not underestimate the power of who you are as a person and what you bring to the table through your research and through your own study and engagement. We also have, in addition to the, I guess, the general sponsored scholarships, we have a number of um, sponsored scholarships. And I want to highlight to you some of those opportunities because what it means is that you have multiple opportunities to apply in that same category. So if you're in the general category and if you're an indigenous person, you can also apply for the indigenous scholarship. That's a second opportunity, okay? And so the Fulbright Indigenous Scholarship is sponsored by the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. It goes across uh, the four categories of scholarships, the post-grad, the post-doc, professional and senior scholarship categories. The, com the National Selection Committee will make a decision on who is the best person. This year we offer two indigenous scholarships. One is the postgraduate and one in the professional category as well. And it's open to any academic discipline and that's what's great about Fulbright. I get, keep asking, getting this question all the time. Is there a quota system for you know, how many doctors get and how many scientists get and how many art students get? There's no quota. We are looking for the best person who can actually be a representative and ambassador for Australia to go to the United States. Um, so it's, the diversity in our applications is wide and varied. And again, this scholarship is valued at $40,000. Another sponsored scholarship is the Fulbright Victorian Scholarship. Now this was established by the endowment fund set up by the Victorian government and Victorian universities and and their contributions. It's open to postgraduates and postdoctoral applicants. What it means is that as a postgraduate student, you apply uh, to, for the Fulbright Scholarship in this particular category, but then you tick the box that you'd like to be considered for the Victorian Fulbright Scholarship as well. There's two criteria there. One, you have to have a Victorian zip code or postcode. Okay, You have to be resident in Victoria. So if you're, if you're from Tasmania, you can't apply for the scholarship, as simple as that. Um, the second point is that if you tick the box, you want to be considered for the scholarship, you have to be able to articulate in a half page. Why you, why Victoria, why do you want to, why do you, what are the benefits that you're going to bring back to Victoria? How are you going to translate this new knowledge? What transformations are going to take place as a result of you going and bring back this new knowledge to Victoria, to your research, to your study, to your practice area, to your discipline. So that's really important. But it should be really clear, short, succinct, you know, and pretty articulate to be able to handle uh, so that the committee can make a decision of whether to say, let's consider this person again in this particular pool. It's another chance for you, okay? And again, it's about $40,000 for eight to 10 months um, in this particular category. So I mentioned before, the scholarship can go to a postgrad or a postdoc. This year it went to Charis Tay, who is a postdoctoral scholar, and she's from the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research. She's going to Stanford University, and she's looking at the body's immune system, how it behaves normally in health, and particularly in cancer. Okay, so she's going to use particular technology to investigate new ways of thinking about immunity and the whole immune system. Um, but it's a great opportunity for you as Victorians to apply for the Victorian Fulbright Postgraduate Scholarship as well. Another opportunity for you is the Fulbright and Wexler's Master's Scholarship in Public Policy. Now remember I told you we do not provide tuition fees. There's always one exception. And this is the exception to that particular scholarship. This is a scholarship sponsored by the Australian Government, the Department of Education and Training. It provides you an opportunity to go and do a full master's degree in public policy. Now public <coughs> policy can be in, across any discipline. It could be in education, it could be in age, uh, disability, it could be in aged care, it could be in climate change, energy, you know, it could be in a range of issues you'd like to address. But it provides you <coughs> the opportunity to do a full master's degree in, in the United States. 
And you look at the amount of money, it's $140,000. Because we want to provide you some sustenance towards your tuition fees. It provides a stipend, it provides establishment allowance, travel allowance, even some additional insurance to support you while you're a student there. So I think it's a fabulous opportunity and Catherine Zealand, um, she, uh, she just got this particular scholarship and I can tell you Catherine's going to make a vast difference in the work she does and she came back uh, the other day. She was in Mozambique doing her work. Uh, she went on her own um, professional duties. She flew out from Mozambique for the Fulbright function two days ago and she was going back to Indonesia and that's the difference in terms of Fulbrighters. It never, they never stop. They're always looking to make a difference and having an impact. And Catherine will be going to the US um, to do her master's degree in public policy. So let me talk about some of the selection process. Our scholarships have just opened on 1st May and they will close on 1st August. Uh, please note that because we work in a global Fulbright system, we use an application system, an online system called the Embark system, which is administered by the Department of State, the US Department of State, and through um, IRE and CIES, who looks after all the other scholarship categories. One of the things you have to understand is that you need to go onto our website, read guidelines, and apply for the right scholarship. And I would advise you seriously to download those guidelines for postgraduates only. There's two sets of guidelines. Only download the postgraduate guidelines. <coughs> it's critical that you apply in the right application, using the right application, so that you start off the process with IIE. So if you are successful, there's a whole trajectory of visa and admin goes behind the scenes in getting your visas and your application process is processed that way. But if you put it in the wrong application and it goes to CIS, it will not be considered the postgraduate category. Okay? So please be aware of that. It's critical that you do this. Um, another point to understand is the rigor of the selection process. So for postgraduates, you know, there's a state selection committee here. Uh, which Deborah works with us to manage. Um, the other thing is then there's a national selection committee. So they make recommendations to the national selection committee. Then it goes to my board of directors which reviews the application and selection outcomes. And then it goes to the Department of State. Then it goes to IIE or the CIES, depending on the scholarship. Committee. And then it goes to the Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board. And that's why it takes months behind the scenes, but you guys don't understand that you're going through, you're jumping through a number of hurdles to get to this process. Um, and through this process, you will have one interview in person if you're shortlisted for that. So we go through a paper-based assessment, and then we shortlist for interviews. And we would like to meet you in person to ask you questions, and the committee is very keen, very interested in who you are and what you bring to the table and to the Fulbright Scholarship, and they want to get to know you. So it's really important for you to be able to articulate who you are and what your proposal is about and what difference you want to make and what you're going to do when you come back to Australia. It's a great opportunity to engage the committee to move you to the next stage of the selection process. Okay, so be strategic. And I can tell you that many a times we haven't put through gold medalists and a lot of times there are myths that you have to be a gold medalist to get a Fulbright, and that's not true. We're looking for the best and brightest people, but we're looking for people who have ambassadorial skills, who can you know, be good ambassadors for themselves, for their country, for the discipline, for the university. So we want the package, all right? If you come to a committee meeting and you say, I'm a gold medalist, I think I deserve a Fulbright now, and I can tick my box off, and I'm looking good, we're like, yep, you don't really need a Fulbright. Um, so you can go on your way and continue your journey with your gold medal. Uh, but it's really important to understand that um, we're looking for people who can triangulate information, who can bring it together in terms of their research and being good ambassadors as well. So your people skills are very important to the committee. This whole process goes on between, you know, September the interviews are scheduled. October again it goes through the selection committee and hopefully by the first or second week in December we will call you 
and tell you. It will be a personal phone call to say you've been selected for a Fulbright scholarship. And that's a, it's a fabulous day for us as well. And it's also a sad day when you have to write those sad letters. Uh, we feel it. Um, but some, another date to keep in mind as you plan your Fulbright is the scholarship begins any time between July 2016 and June um, 2017. So we are flexible with you and you can choose your timing and be very strategic. This is really important in choosing your timing because you are postgraduates, you want to be mentored when you go to the States. We just don't want to be sitting down there and not getting that support. And I'll come back to you when I talk about one of the key documents you need to bring. So some of the selection criteria we're talking about is your academic and your professional excellence. Of course, you have to be able to show us certified copies of who you are, what your grades are, upload that, all those documents. Um, remember, we're looking for the holistic uh, approach of things. We need to know your proposed program. What do you want to achieve in these eight to 10 months? And regardless of your scholarship being eight to 10 months, and if you're going for a full degree of two years, we still want to know what you want to do with that program of study. Okay. Um, what are the potential outcomes of your research? What are the potential outcomes of your program of study? Those are really important key aspects coming through in your application. And like I've stressed before, the importance of your ambassadorial skills. Now, as a binational um, Australian-American commission, this is open to Australian citizens only, and we are looking to send people who are, who are Australians to the United States to bring them back here. And so if you're a green card holder and you have dual citizenship with the United States, then you're ineligible for the scholarship application. But you may have dual citizenship with another country, Australia and another country, and that's okay to apply to Australia. There's no age limit. You're never too old to study or to have a research experience. Please understand that, and we are open to this, okay? Um, it's open to any field and host institution. Can I stress the importance of host institution? As postgraduates, you want the best experience, especially PhD students who want to take this time. You want to go to the best host institution where you're getting access to data, to knowledge, to um, mentorship. We are looking for all of those things that the host can give you, not a desk and library access. That wouldn't cut it for a host invitation letter. This is an opportunity for you to go on a journey and to come back a different person as well. So we are looking for people with host institutions who can support you as well. So there's another myth. You don't have to go to Harvard or Stanford to get a Fulbright. We had a physicist last year who was going to Montana State University. Simple reason is the mentor is the right person at that university. The data is the best data there she can access. And that's, you know, and she's the best person to go. So it was important to say that you don't have to go always to an Ivy League university, okay? So please be aware of these opportunities for you. And of course, we want you to be a resident in Australia for two years before applying, because we want to see your commitment to Australia as well in giving back. So read the website, look at the FAQs. We have a lot of FAQs on the website. Look at it, identify the best scholarship, so you know whether the general scholarship, of course, you're gonna apply, but if you're, you know, if you want to apply for the public policy, is that the second opportunity you want to be considered for? Uh, if you're an indigenous person, there's another opportunity. If you're a Victorian scholar, some of you might say, the Victorian, the state-based scholarship does not apply to me. And that's okay. You don't have to apply for it. Okay? Because your research might be just national or international based. And so we get a lot of queries. Do I have to apply for Victoria? Would I be looked upon differently if I don't apply? And that's not the case. It's your choice. It's your decision. Can I just stress about the host um, institution we talked about, about negotiating the best host institution. So if you're going to do a full master's degree, we understand that you might not have had um, your application into the program yet accepted, and there's a whole process of GREs, GMATs, and all of that. The other point I'd stress is if you get a Fulbright, don't always think that you'll get into the program of study. Okay. Getting a Fulbright doesn't give you automatic entry into a university. You have to follow the university criteria as well, okay? And meet their, meet their criteria. 
but you might not have decided which university, so you might actually put in three universities you would like to go to, why it's important to you. And what's really important as postgraduates is to show us and demonstrate initiative. So you might have written to a professor or a director of uh, graduate studies there or the dean, and you're saying you're interested in this particular university. Use that evidence in your application to show us that you've actually made contact with these folks in the United States through these, with these universities. That's a nice way to demonstrate to the committee that you've taken initiative. You're actually preparing, you're planning. Um, it shows it goes, shows good practice as a postgraduate student. Um, but if you're a postgraduate student who's a PhD student in Australia who wants to take time off, you really need to have a host letter of invitation from your host to support your application. And think of the host letter of invitation as almost like a fourth referee for you. Okay? It's really important. That shows that they're keen on you. They want to have you. You're going to challenge them. You're going to make a difference in their, you know, with their graduate students. That's really important as well. I like to focus on getting referees letters of support. I'm going to stress the word supportive referees. Because please be aware that your referees may be giving referee letters for other, other applicants in the same pool. And I've seen them as my team and the committee see how they grade you against the people they're giving. So it's really important to share your proposal with your referee. Ask them if they're going to be supportive of you. Um, you can gently ask them if they're providing letters for other people. And then decide whether you want to use them as referees. Okay, it's your right. It's your, it's, it, think of Fulbright as your destiny. You want to get to the United States, I've got to go there. And a referee letter is important in supporting this process and application. So get three supportive referees for you. Think of three people who can write about three different areas of who you are as a person, your research, comment on your research, what you might bring back in terms of outcomes, what the impact might be. Those are important aspects to come through. Um, not just in filling out and ticking boxes. We want them to tell us a story why they want to be a referee for you and why, why do they want you to go to the United States and what's the impact. That is really important. And finally, I'm going to say to you, get someone outside your field of study to proofread your application. We have multidisciplinary panels, selection panels. So if you are from the arts, get someone from the sciences. If you're from the sciences, get someone from the social sciences or the arts to review your application. Get that multidisciplinary perspective. Bring, bring, um, bring put into your application so committee members can understand and articulate what you're trying to say through this process. And as I stressed before, use the right application form. I can't tell you how many postgraduates who use the wrong form. They were really good applications, but I could, them, could not move them forward. Um, <coughs> So, key aspects of your application, project proposal. I'll say this to the senior scholars, but I'm going to say this to you as well, especially if you're, if you're a PhD student. I'll say, do not cut and paste any of your ARC and HMRC application, research application, into the full right application. It doesn't work. The cut and paste job doesn't work. We really need you to articulate and contextualize your project and your project proposal. What are the key objectives? Uh, what's the time frame? You think you can achieve this? Why it's important to do this? What's the impact? But think about the multiplier effect of your research or your program of study. That's really critical here. Um, the second important point I'm going to talk about is your personal statement. Now the personal statement is one of the most difficult and challenging things to write. It's only a page long, but it's really important for us and the selection committee to be able to see who you are behind this researcher, behind the student, and behind this professional. We want to get to know you. And we want to hear your voice and your story. So where you've been, where you are, and where would you like to go? It's that professional trajectory we're looking for as well. And I think it's really important to articulate your personal sentiments coming through. I mean, we don't want sob stories, but Certainly, and we can tell you if you're fibbing. And I'm telling you if, you, if you say something wonderful or whatever you say in your personal statement, and if you're picked up for a, and shortlisted for an interview, expect to be asked a question about your personal statement. Committee members will get into very specific details through your application. They're not shy. Um, so that's really important for you to understand. 
but it's one of the most difficult things to write, and it's a reflective piece of who you are. And a lot of times, I think, as posed by the students or even as professionals, we seldom take time to reflect on who we are. This is your chance to write that reflective piece. Um, three referee reports required, they are confidential, okay? Please note they're confidential. So when you go into the Embark system and you register your, your details and your login and you have access, you will need to put in three referee contact details. The system then will send out an individual email request to those uh, referees to upload their, uh, to upload their, uh, their reports. I think what you have to understand is that the same timeline of August 1st applies to your referee report. The only thing you can possibly do is hassle them. Hassle them to get the referee report there on time. And if they're having technical trouble, they've been given guidelines on how to do things. But please be aware, it's confidential. We talked about the host letter of invitation and support. That's really important, especially if you're a visiting PhD student. And I'll also say this, as a visiting PhD student, you do not pay tuition fees when you're there, okay? But be aware, some of the universities, like the Ivy League universities, will charge you admin fees, which can be, end up in thousands of dollars as well. And I can tell you, I've tried to negotiate that, and that's the only thing I've had been successful in, because they charge it anyway to anyone who comes to the university. It's, it's something which um, John can talk about these things. So you can go in and out of the Embark application as many times. When you update your application, please hit the Save button. And finally, when you're going to submit your form on the, before the August 1st de deadline, please hit the Submit button. If you do not hit the Submit button, it's just floating around in the system. And we cannot move it to the next stage of our selection process. So these are important things. Seems like it's basics, but I can't tell you how many people I can see applications there complete haven't hit the submit button. Okay. Fulbright offers you a number of opportunities and gives you a platform. It does come with its conditions and it's my duty to kind of put that forward to you today. You will go on a Fulbright J1 visa. There is a two-year home residency requirement, which means that once you come back from the United States, you're supposed to stay in Australia for two years. It doesn't stop you to go to the United States for conferences, for meetings, for you know holidays. It means you cannot apply for a working visa, J, you know H1B1 or permanent residency, all of those kind of categories of visas. Okay. So be aware of that and be informed about this before you consider applying for the Fulbright. Um, the other thing is the second one is we have a lot of media attention. Most universities will do a lot of media releases. There's People will be interviewed, radio interviews, paper-based, uh, you know, you'll have a lot of interviews and a lot of opportunities of engagement, and that's something our scholars and students get involved in, and to deal with a lot of guests as well at events. And finally, if you are unsuccessful, we do not provide feedback on the application. I get a lot of calls saying, tell me where I went wrong. It's not about right or wrong at that point, it's about the competitive, the pool, pool was so competitive that you just didn't make it to the next stage. And we cannot provide you feedback. For one thing is we are following the policy of the Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board. But then reasons for non-recommendation is including feedback cannot be given because each year the application pool changes. So next year, if you apply again, you actually have to log into Embark with a new applicant, with a new ID. Because we, we start from scratch. We never go back and look back and say, where did this person go wrong? Or what did they do wrong? We are always saying fresh start, fresh slate. Let's move it forward. So you have that option to present yourself again. And I can tell you, people who have applied two or three times have got a Fulbright. Or they've said this has been the best experience so far to even do the application, even come to an interview process. And even if I wasn't, was unsuccessful, it was a great opportunity for me to learn. And they've come back, I know the number of people have come back and been successful again. So I'm going to wrap up here and then invite Ruth and uh, John to come forward to just talk about uh, some of the experiences as full writers. But when you're writing your application, bring the passion of, about your field of study. You know, it's really important to show you're passionate about it. That's why I say don't cut and paste any research applications into your full writer. It doesn't, it doesn't you know, come full circle. Think about the vision for yourselves and your field of study and what do you want to do when you grow up? I 
Think about your excellence. What are the key points of your excellence that will make this application a success? Make your Fulbright journey a success. Bring your innovation. We're looking for creativity and inspiration in terms of your own thinking. Uh, we do not mind out-of-box thinking. It's really, you know, we, we want that to come through. And like I said before, do not underestimate the power of who you are as a postgraduate student, simply because you as postgraduate students can build collaborations, can build linkages between your supervisors, between your mentors and teachers and hosts and home institutions. So think outside the box there. So don't think of, I'm just going to get a degree and qualification and come back. It's more than that. Full <coughs> is more than that. Um, and of course, your ambassadorial skills. Bring your personalities. We want to see it. And let it shine. Let it shine through your engagement um, and showcase your excellence and even your philanthropic spirit of giving to the community. That is so important for full life. We want people who think beyond the self. We want people to think about the other because this is a global program. So there's another program we have, which is a specialist program. And it might not be related to um, postgraduate students, but it's really an institution, and I'll talk more about this at the um, senior scholars, but it's about bringing specialists to your university as well. And if your university is interested in this, or your supervisors are interested in building partnership with the US, ask them to contact the commission, and we can put them in touch about the Fulbright Specialist Program. It's about bringing experts to your university. We have a number of sponsors, and I'd like to acknowledge all our sponsors who make this happen. We gave about 48 scholarships this year for Australians and Americans, 46 to 48. Um, next year it might be more. Uh, so Australians and Americans, so that's the way we do it. And I think for Australians this year, we'll end up with about 31 scholarships in the end. Uh, let's see how we go with the selection process. And, and sometimes we have money, but we do not award the scholarship simply because we're looking for the best person in that category. And we do not want to be tokenistic in offering a scholarship just because we have funding as well. Okay? So be aware of that. Um, call us. Call us with informed questions. That means you read the website, you become familiar with key things, you read the guidelines, and then you write an informed question. So we can give you an informed answer. Um, and then you can contact Dr. Ruth Lee Martin or Ms. Fiona Goggins, um, scholarships officer at the office. Email is a good way to write. So very key, short, succinct emails. We'll get a passive response as well.